<laughs> Thanks, Susan. <laughs> Glad you're doing good. All right. So uh, this is the reports interest group. Thanks, everybody, for coming, even though um, I had to push it off for a week. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Jessica Wolford. I've been at Bibliomation for many, many years now, um, and I've just recently uh, stepped into the role as Director of Member Services after serving as the Evergreen Systems Manager for a uh, number of years. So um, this is a, so I'm taking on a new role and still chugging away at reports. <laughs> uh, so there, uh, I, I want to, first of all, I'll go ahead and share my screen and then I can start the, the meeting. So this is the first time I've done any presenting with Canva. So hopefully it goes fine. I think I think it will. Okie dokie. And we got screen one. Share that. Okay. So everybody can see my presentation okay? Looks like it's okay. Just making sure. Awesome. See some thumbs up. All righty. I'll try my best to keep to to keep an eye on the chat, but uh, I might uh, start getting going here. So we're going to talk about auditor tables today. And as I said in my announcement about the meeting, um, it does auditor tables are not exposed by the reporter. So they uh, are exposed to the reporter. Uh, so you would need database access in order to access these. Read only is fine because we're only going to be doing selects on these. We didn't, we're not going to be doing any updating or anything like that. So um, as long as you have read only access to your database or higher, you can use these to do lots of things. And uh, do we have anybody, just so that I know who's in the audience today, do we have anybody who's an end user that wouldn't have access to their database? And by the database, I mean like going in and running SQL queries like directly in something like PG Admin. Okay. I don't know, Beth, I don't know why uh, auditor tables aren't recruit included in the reporter sources. My guess is that they're very big <laughs> and they might slow things down a bit, but I'm not 100% sure what the, the reasoning behind that is. Uh, okay, Melissa says she doesn't, but she's curious about how it all works. Okay, so I will keep in mind that there are some folks that uh, maybe are not uh, SQL uh, familiar with SQL as I, as I'm talking, uh, and I know that there are quite a few of you that are familiar with it. So I will try in my best to not talk down to anybody, but also not use words that you might not be familiar with uh, if you're if you're not a a SQL veteran. All right, so first of all, I want to say a big thank you. I don't think she's here. I didn't see her come in, but uh, to Elizabeth Davis, who was uh, kind enough to step in and run the reports interest group meetings for me while I was on maternity leave. Um, this is my daughter. Uh, she is now five months old, going on six months, which is incredibly hard to believe. Um, she's the cutest. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so she thanks Elizabeth too. So that's uh, that's great. I cannot, I, I probably thanked her a million times, but I will definitely thank her a million and one times now. <laughs> Uh, and she will also be stepping in to run the interest group meeting at the conference because I will have a conflict on the day that we're supposed to be meeting. So that uh, another million and one thank yous to Elizabeth for for stepping in and doing that. But that I just that slide I just put in there like moments ago, but I was like, that's the most important slide in the whole presentation. So. <laughs> All 
All righty. So a little introduction about what auditor tables are and uh, what they do. Uh, so auditor tables, they basically take a copy, like a snapshot of a row in the database every time that it's updated. Uh, and it also will keep track of if, it, if the information is available, the user that did the updating and the workstation where it was done. If you're making updates like directly in the database, obviously that information is not going to be in there. Um, and there's sometimes when like something happens in the background and the information doesn't get put in there that that was like a system update. Um, but if that information is available, it will be included. And um, it's really useful for answering questions about when a change is made and who made the change if that information is available to the auditor table to take a look at. Um, some caveats about using these is not all tables in the database are audited. I have another slide where I go through which tables are actually included in that auditor schema uh, that we can that we can use. Um, and your system administrator, because as I said, they they can get really kind of large and bloated, um, might have it on a regular schedule to purge rows from those tables on a regular basis. So um, there might you might not have a full history of what happened to a particular row in a database because you, you only have so much inf information going back so far. Um, so you would need to find out from your system administrator how much of the auditor logs that they actually get kept in those tables in order to figure out what you have access to. Uh, it also takes a little bit of practice in order to be able to read them correctly. And even to this day, I've been using them for a long time and I kind of get confused sometimes about like, what does this line mean and which, how am I supposed to be looking at this? And I'll explain that um, as we're, as we're going through how you're supposed to, to read them and interpret them. All right, so this is a list of all the auditor tables that are available circa 311. I don't use, we don't use all of these. I don't use all of these personally, so I might misspeak about what they are for. Um, the ones that are bolded, I can tell you for certain what they are. <laughs> and well, those are the ones we're going to be focusing on today because those are the ones that um, uh, I use and that uh, other people have told me that they're they're interested in in learning about how to how to read. Um, so they're the feed the first few are for act fund debits and invoices. I, if I'm understanding correctly, I think that act voice act invoice entry history is for the like circa three well before the angular acquisitions updates. Uh, and the the one uh, for ACK invoice item history is for after that. Uh, the reason I think that is because on our 3.9 database, uh, the uh, invoice uh, item history is not there, and it is in there after um, the the three uh, in the 311 versions of the database. So that's kind of how I put two and two together there. I might be wrong about that. Um, hopefully somebody who knows ACK better than me can uh, can confirm or deny <laughs> what those tables actually do. Um, and uh, what you're going to notice as we as we look through here, if you're if you are at all familiar with the database, what these actually are is so this is the first thing here is a schema in the database, and the next part is the table, and the last part is just history. So that tells you this is an auditor table. Um, so these all correspond to real tables that exist in the database and uh, these get updated every time they are updated. Uh, so what we're going to be focusing on here today, you, you can do, I, and I could see where this would be useful, the um, action trigger event definition history. So the event definitions, if you don't know, are how you define uh, things like notices and automatic actions like getting marked lost, um, things like that. So anytime a change is made to those, uh, a row will get updated in, in this table. So I could see where that would be useful in, in, the, in a lot of cases. 
um, but we haven't used it so far. Um, the actor org unit is for any time the org unit table gets updated. I know for our, us, it doesn't get updated that much. So we don't we haven't really seen a, a use for that too much. Um, and the actor user address history would would look at patron or staff account addresses, anything that's in that actor user table. Actor user, if you again, if you're uninitiated, um, is where all of the patron accounts and staff accounts, any anybody that uses the Evergreen system, the, the, everything is in that table. So if you're looking for information about when a patron account or a staff account got updated, that's where that lives. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think there was a uh, question in one of the previous uh, reports interest group meetings that about uh, like how to tell when a phone number got updated. And that is the answer to that question. That's where where that all lives. Um, then there's asset call number history. Haven't really had a, a need to use that one so far, um, but it's there. And this is the one is the big one, the asset copy history. I use that probably at least once a week because a library wants to know like how did it how did this item get into the status and where did it travel to before it got you know back to my my library kind of thing um so this one is very very helpful for figuring out you know things like things about that uh, Taryn says they use actor user history all the time for when whole notification preferences get changed that's a good use for it um Oh yeah, I didn't say when that would be used, but yeah, that's good. That's good too. Uh, all right, and bibliomonograph part history. We haven't used this one traditionally either, but I could imagine that that would be very useful because um, parts are always a little bit uh, funky. Um, uh, Biblio record entry history, we haven't used very much either, but there was a case for it that uh, that folks wanted to to look at. So I did a little query, a um, little bit of research on that. And then these two, two here, the circ matrix match point and hold matrix match point, um, that's where your hold rules and your circulation rules are. And that uh, gives a, some details about when the rule was updated, and if you're doing it in the in the user interface in in the web client, it will tell you who did those those updates and at one what, what workstation. Um, for us, and I'll talk about this as we go through the tables. We actually do all of our edits to those rules directly in the database, so we don't get the um the user information in there but we do get like when they got updated so that can be kind of helpful to figure out you know a little history of of how those rules changed over time uh and then the serial unit history uh i believe would just be a, a history of serial items again not something that we use um at all at this point but uh but it's there for you if uh if you need it so any questions so far? I know I'm going a little bit fast through all this stuff. Okay, going once, going twice, moving on. All right, so there are in all of these tables, they all have sort of three components to them. Uh, the first three columns are always the audit ID, which is, if you don't know database parlance, it's the primary key for that table. So that means it's like the unique ID, ID number uh, for the that auditor table. And the database needs to have that in order to make a new row for integrity. Um, it also has the audit time, which is the time that that, got, that row got added to the table, and the audit action. Uh, and you will see only two types of actions where, for this. Um, you'll see either update, that's the most frequent one that you'll see, and sometimes you might see delete. Uh, Evergreen doesn't generally delete 
rows uh, usually just mark something as deleted. So you won't see that very often, but if you're they've deleted something directly from the database, you might see it. Um, but you'll never, uh, so there's uh, in, in the, in sort of programming world, uh, there's this thing called CRUD. Um, so it's create, read, update, delete. Um, so that's where that those U and D comes from. So you'll, you'll never see a create um, and you will rarely see a delete and you won't see a read because it doesn't update it every time someone looks at it. It only updates on, it only, it only updates on actual updates or deletions. Okay. <clears throat> and the second component is the audit user, the user who made the, the change and the audit workstation. And there will, there will be the, the workstation where that change was made. And you're actually gonna see these columns change their location depending on what table we're looking at. And the reason for that is uh, I think at some point those those columns got added to these tables and they, they got added at the end. And then um, for example, like in actor user, we, we got things like preferred names and stuff like that that had got it added after that. So you'll see those actor usernames like kind of like in the middle of that table or toward the end. And then you'll see stuff coming up after it. So uh, depending on when that table got created and all that good stuff, you're gonna see you're gonna see those two fields show up in different places. And and a lot of times you might not see anything in those fields depending on the kind of update that was was made to your stuff. And then the third component is the actual contents of the table. Now, this is important and to realize when you're reading these tables is what is happening is that it's making a copy of the state of that row when the up, like before the update was made. So for example, I go in, I change a slurk modifier on an item um, and then I hit save. If that was the last change that was made, I'm not going to see the new circ modifier in the auditor table. I'm going to see what the circ modifier was before, like right before I hit save. So this is just like making a little snapshot of that point in time when the update was made. So, and 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 um, we'll look at some examples of of how that ends up working and how you can can read it going up forward. Any questions on any of this? Okay, now we're getting into the nitty gritty examples. Okay, so as I said, the for us, uh, by far and away, the at auditor asset copy history table is the one that is used the most. Um, and this is just a very simple query that you can run on it, um, looking at the ID of an item and, um, and sorting it by <clears throat> audit time. So we're gonna, and we're gonna ignore the first three columns for now because that'll come up in the next slide. So I will click on this. And as you can see, this is just, uh, this is real data from our database that I uploaded to Google Docs for demonstration purposes. And I tried my best to uh, kind of anonymize any data that was actually in here that might, um, that might have some some information in it that we don't necessarily want out on the internet. <laughs> so the the all over here is um, the green. So I did kind of color coordinate it based on uh, what that original slide was. So the one and the two and the three. Um, so the the green part here is the audit ID, audit time, audit action section. Um, and then the purple here is the, the table and the, the copies of the, of the rows in that table pertaining to this one particular item. And then at the end here is the audit user audit workstation, uh, situation. So that's, what's going on there. And this was actually, was a real example of, um, someone wanted to figure out what happened with the transit for this item, but it had been marked missing. So 
at the the transit was kind of hanging in there but it wasn't it, w it was showing it was the status was it wasn't matching so as you can see here uh this was marked well let me actually wait on that to, to get into this so if you were just to do this query we're going to ignore these three columns for now uh you would have to in order to figure out you know, you can see the status. Where's the status? You got to kind of hunt for it. So here's the status. You can see they're 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 numbers, and that's pertain. That's uh, going into the the co the status table, config copy status table. Um, it would be the IDs of those statuses. So if you have those memorized, awesome. If you don't have them memorized, then you might be scratching your head and have to go look them up. And my personal opinion is that every time you memorize a database ID, that there's puppies and kittens crying somewhere. So uh, I don't, I don't recommend it. Um, <clears throat> so, and then the, of course, same thing with the audit user, audit workstation. You can go look these up. Uh, it, obviously, there's no way you're going to memorize um, unless unless you've got repeat offenders or something like that. Uh, you're not going to memorize workstation IDs and and user IDs. Um, so, you know, it's got some utility, and you can go look those up in the other tables. But you might want to make it a little easier on yourself, and that's where the next uh, thing comes in. So here's a query with useful joins on it. So we're joining the config copy status, so we don't have to look up the ID. And we're doing a left outer join on actor workstation and actor user. Does anyone know why we're doing a left outer join? Bueller. <laughs> All right, I'll bail you out. Um, so left outer join is used when the items in your table, you want all of those rows to show up. So we're starting with the auditor asset copy history table. So we want all those rows to show up. If we just did a regular join and there was no information in the actor workstation or actor user table or, or column, we would not see those rows. Yeah, we want, that's right, Lindsay. We want them always there. Um, so we do a left outer join so so we can get the information when we when it is there but we don't need we, but we don't need to um you know we can have those those columns empty if uh if they if we don't if that information isn't there so yes um so again going back to my results it's the same it's the same link but uh now i've got and now we can pay attention to these things um, so as you can see, we had the item was in transit and it went into transit in like 2021 and then some kind of funky things happens, uh, you know, right here it got, it was, um, let's see. so it went on the hold shelf and then, uh, this recently returned here that kind of indicates that it got checked in in a funky way like they might have had a a, a, um, a check-in modifier enabled that like retargeted the hold so it got um, to this funky status at a place where it's not owned uh, and then but then they fixed that they put it back into transit um, and there it looks like this item was like checked in to like check on it in, in some cases and then uh, later on, it got checked in at at Bethel. The transit got canceled, and then it was marked missing. So we can go back to this library and say, "Well, it looks like on you know July whatever 
it was the the transit got canceled and then it was marked missing. So, and uh, so you can check with that other library and see if it's on their shelf. Maybe check with um, the courier service to see if it's if if it got lost somewhere along the way. And other otherwise, you know, it might just be kind of missing. So that's the kind of thing that we have used this for in the past. And also um, uh, another frequent one is to ask, ask you the question, why is this item accepting holds when it says a CERC modifier that, you know, doesn't allow for holds or something like that? Um, and we can look at it and say, well, well, on this date, it had a circuit modifier that did allow holds and looks like you changed it on this date. So those are just holds that are kind of uh, stuck on it from when it had that uh, holdable uh, state. Correct. So that's another another use for it. And I'm sure you can find lots and lots more for this. OK, so actor user history. Um, we have we haven't traditionally used this, but we might start using it uh, a little bit more. Um, so again, here's a very simple query on that, just to select star and the ID number, and we're ordering by audit time. And I didn't show you how to read the the rows on this one, so I'll I'll try and remember to do that here. All right, so again, we're um, ignoring these few first columns and we're just doing, looking at these. So again, we've got our, our green stuff with the audit time. And then we've got our rows with the, with the table. Looks like the email changed a few times. This is my dog's account. So I didn't null that out, but, but he's, not a person he's never been to a library so uh, we don't have to worry about that and then of course because uh, I do a lot of testing at different locations his home library has changed many many times his birth date changed a bunch and uh, and yeah and a lot of the changes are just like me doing uh, doing stuff so as you can see the um, the auditor user and the workstation are all are kind of like in the middle here yeah and then the guardian got added so going back to the presentation here is that same table with some joins to help us out again we're joining the um, workstation and the user on those the audit uh, workstation and user and then we're also joining the permission group so that you don't have to uh, do that and if you wanted to you could also join the actor.org unit so that you don't have to look that up um, and uh, there's lots of things there's lots of ways you could use this and again we're looking at this by id and looking at a history of this patron so going back to those first few columns I do want to sort of um, say, let's say for example, the permission group on this is now adults. We wouldn't see that change here because that would be the last change that was made. But this row is doing, but it would have been made on that date. So what this row is doing is it's saying, this is the state that that row was in when, when it was updated. So, or, yeah. Alrighty. So are there any questions about this stuff? All right, cool. Um, oh, I guess I should say, like, you can see when the email changed here. So if you're looking at um, stuff here, you can see, so this would be the time, this 622.23, 23 
that this email was updated from email two to email one. So in, instead of, in, you, you'd also need to kind of look backwards at the date in order to, to be able to read these effectively. <clears throat> Alrighty. Okay, here's some more examples. Um, so this is the same kind of query on the Biblio record entry history uh, column or uh, table. And when I was originally thinking about doing this, uh, this was an example that Elizabeth gave about uh, wanting to see who had edited the um, the item form to R on some of their records that where it wasn't appropriate. And I had thought about, you know, doing a something fancy where we tried and found those items and then like did a join and, and um, you know, try and find things. But what I found with using the auditor tables is that you really kind of want to limit your searching to kind of looking at one thing at a time because otherwise it gets too confusing to look at so it's really if you have if you're able to get the 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 id of the bib record uh and and plug that in or for the other examples the idea of the item the idea of the the patron um, because those things are are things that are, aren't going to change um that's really the best way to do it because then you can see the full history of that one thing um, so in then that example, you'd want to uh, sort of look at a couple of different examples of an item where that got changed inappropriately, and then just focus in on looking at those items and when they got updated. Um, so in this example, uh, I'm not showing you the simple queries anymore because um, we kind of hammered that point home in the other, other few examples. So this is just... Um, adding the user in the workstation to this. Um, it'd be hard to add other stuff to the Biblio record entry um, table because a lot of it is it, the stuff that based on the bib records references that Biblio record entry ID directly. So if you try and join something like a call number or um, a, uh, I don't know, like a item attribute something like that it's going to show you what it is right now because that's what because you're just you'd just be joining that table again so it's not going to show you if those changed it's only going to show you changes that happened to that table so it it only really makes sense to um join things that kind of stay static um you know for example if somebody updated their username and you would, had joined the um the actor user table and we're looking at it, you wouldn't see that there was a change to the username. You just see what the username is now. So that's that's uh, something to keep in mind too when you're kind of playing around with, with writing different clear queries. All right, so we can look at the results for this. So you can see a lot of these ones are, and I did a descending on this one. So the, the newer ones are up at the top. Um, a lot of these ones are just database updates, things that got changed um, in the record. And where it kind of starts to get more interesting is uh, up here. And we, we've got an actual user that we can look at. And you can see that what happened there was that it got merged. So this was the, the account that merged those items. Um, and in this case, you're probably going to want to look at the, the mark specifically to see when it changed. Like, you, um, okay, let's see if I can do this. It's a little funky and... Uh, Um, when I was looking at, yeah, you can kind of see that these, some of these are different. Yeah. So some of that stuff changes throughout. So the, the easiest thing to do when you have something like this is to kind of take it and copy it and paste it in something else, like 
Notepad++ or uh, just regular Notepad so that you can see uh, what's going on, where how things changed with the with the mark in these records. Okay. And then here's a query on circ matrix match points. Uh, again, this is circ rules. So for this, um, we actually for a while had been using this as just a like regular select star query um, without doing the joins. Um, but as I was working on this presentation, I was like, we could make this better. So I've joined uh, things like the recurring fine rule and the permission group so that we can take a look at that. Yeah, so again, this one is has all that stuff right in the in the front. So the workstation and the user are right there. Um, but I also have my duration rules and my my stuff right there. Oh, uh, did I not sort these before I exported it? Yeah, I guess I didn't put my my order by in there before I before I exported this. So they're they're not in any. So that let that be a lesson to you. Oh wait. No, it's not. Let that be a lesson to you. Always do your always put your order by clause at the end um so that, that you don't end up with uh, rules that are out of order here. Um see if there's anything interesting I can show you about this one. Oh yeah, grace periods changed. And then we added some, uh, this was a, something that happened during COVID. We uh, made a lot of things, no fines, but then we knew that the libraries were gonna wanna revert and go back to fines eventually. So the description field we used to keep track of what those original uh, fine rules were. And as you can see, there's no, nobody's got any actor users or workstations uh, in here because we, uh, we don't, we do all of our changes to these directly in the database. So those won't be recorded. All right, so here's an example of a query that uh, you can do on, you know, sort of multiple things. Uh, I happen to know that I did a change for this library pretty recently on all of their movie circ modifiers, and and they they wanted to let their movies go or go into transit, their DVDs and things like that. Um, so I made that change to all of those modifiers and. So what you can see here, it's got all of their, their movie circ modifiers listed. And I did uh, an order by on the, on just audit time, because I changed them uh, modifier by modifier. And you can see that there, they were changed just on the second. And what you would see now in the actual database, like they're they're showing as active here, but they would be active as false in in the real database. So that's a a real life example of how things have changed. Um, I didn't do any uh, joins on this one because uh, I actually do have these user groups um, kind of memorized and the the org units kind of as well. Um, and then the rest of it's just kind of like true false boolean stuff. So there's not really too much to join in this one. Oops. Come on now. Oh, you know what? I think that's the end. <laughs> um, all right. So does anybody have any questions on on anything that I that I talked about today or anything that you'd be curious about whether or not you could use an audit or audit table to do.
Hey, this is Susan from Pines. Hi. Um, I was wondering, is it possible to see who created a library card account? That's a good question. Let me go back to my... Escape. There we go. Let's go back to actor user. There we go. So, oh yeah, you know what? I deleted a lot of the old stuff from here. I kind of don't think so because the the purpose of the auditor table is to catch the state before a change was made and if the item doesn't exist yet or the the user doesn't exist yet there's nothing to go back in time to you know what i'm saying yeah that's so, what I'm... yeah <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah we uh, put on chris's long to-do list of hey how can we figure this out <laughs> to see who, um, yeah, who created an account, but yeah, we found the same thing, but thank you. just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else have anything or other ways that you've other things that you've used the auditor tables for? Okay. Uh, I'll start doing my closing remarks then. Um, so I will put these up in the wiki and so that people can look at them. I'll put the slides up uh, on the wiki as well so you can go back and refer to these. Uh, I hope this was helpful to, to folks um, and not a rehash of stuff that you already know. Uh, but hey, there's always new folks coming in. Um, so hopefully that'll be helpful to somebody out there. Um, and um, the next meeting will be at the end of the month. Kind of weird that we're having two meetings in the shortest month of the year, but this is kind of the way it, it worked out. Um, and uh, Tiffany Little from Pines will be joining us to talk about acquisitions reports. So little bit of a crossover with the acquisitions interest group. So if you've got some ACK reports that you've been struggling with, or um, if you want some some more information about that, like please feel free to reach out um, via the listserv and uh, we will, or to me directly or to Elizabeth directly, and uh, we will get that information for you. We'll make sure that uh, that, that comes through. All right, any uh, thing that's not related to auditor tables that uh, folks want to talk about before we before we wrap up. Okay. Well, have a good rest of your afternoon, and we'll see you in a few weeks for uh, for the next the next go around. Thanks, everybody.